Hi, I'm Sal Mercagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, a former merchant mariner and an adjunct professor and instructor in maritime industry policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On in the Suez and What the Hell's Going On in Long Beach and Los Angeles, and also Montreal. Uh, today I was going to have a special episode for you. I was going to talk about some history of containerization. I was going to feature a couple of books right here that talk about this show you some sites and talk about how containerization has changed the world over the past 70 years or so, but that's not going to happen because we've got a whole batch of breaking news on what's going on in the Suez and a batch of other places too at the same time. So let me share with you my screen real quick and we'll jump into here and start looking at what is going on out there in the world. So first off here, uh, went through a batch of stories. I posted this on my Twitter feed, but uh, these are the latest going on with regard to Ever Given in the Suez. So first off, this was posted uh, uh, early today uh, by John Conrad over at G-Captain that the American Bureau of Shipping has been able to get on board the vessel and issue them uh, clearance that they are good to sail. Basically, the hull is in good shape that they can go ahead and get underway. Uh, they've done their ex uh, inspections to the American Bureau of Shipping, ABS, is the classification society they've been doing underwater inspections make sure there weren't cracks and, and, and issues with the hull and so now they are basically free to free uh, sail however at the same time as we find out the egyptian government has arrested the vessel as i mentioned to you in an earlier uh, uh, video uh, ships operate very much like human beings in some cases they can be physically arrested now obviously you don't go out, this is not a, a, you know, law and order Suez Canal edition. Uh, but what this is, is you can basically hold the vessel and make the vessel have to pay damages incurred by the vessel. So, you know, imagine your car, you get into an accident, people can't seize your car and sell your car off to claim damages. They can sue you and then you can, may have to sell your car to do it. But in this case, the vessel itself can be held responsible. And so in an Egyptian court, they filed a $916 million, we went down below a billion, uh, case against the P&I insurance, the UK club for Ever Given. And I'll break that down in a minute, what exactly they're, they're talking about in there. Uh, obviously BSM, which is the German-based operator of the vessel, is, is disappointed. Uh, for this, uh, but with the Ever Given being arrested, and that happens at times, we've seen vessels be arrested for issues associated with uh, uh, late fees and funds and not paying bills. Vessels will arrive in port and be arrested in 2016. Hanjin Line, which was a, uh, a Korean uh, container line, seventh largest container line in the world at the time, uh, declared bankruptcy and they ordered their vessels not to sail into ports for fear of arrest. And some vessels basically meandered off coast until they had to come in to do this. This is the uh, statement here by BSM. Just want to read it real quick. Uh, the SCA, Suez Canal Authority's decision to arrest the vessel is extremely disappointing. From the outset, BSM and the crew on board have cooperated fully with all authorities, including the SCA and their respective investigations into the grounding. This include granting access to the voyage data recorder, the VDR is the black box, and other materials and data requested by the SCA. They had actually asked for a questionnaire to be filled out by the captain and crew. They initially didn't fill it out because they were busy you know, saving the ship from sinking, uh, but they subsequently filled it out and provided it. BSM's primary goal is a swift resolution of the matter will allow the vessel and crew to depart the Suez Canal, said Ian Beveridge, the CEO of BSM. So obviously, uh, if you're the manager for the vessel, BSM, if you're the owner of the vessels, which is a Japanese corporation, or if you're the operator, the overarching thing, uh, which is Taiwan's Evergreen, you want the vessel released. You want to get the cargo off. You want to get this vessel in the dry dock. It's making you no money right now. Matter of fact, it's costing you money. So that's the big issue going on here. The other interesting story was this one. I, I just, again, anything with the digger, I'm going to talk about. I am sorry, I, this is the iconic image of this event right here. There's a meme here that the Suez Canal Authority will get his money. This is taken from the Facebook page of the Suez Canal Authority. Now, I apologize if the translation is not exactly accurate. I actually helped provide this story for uh, G Captain. Uh, and I use the uh, translator function that's provided with, with uh, Facebook. 
So uh, this is what it says here. The authorities' failure to pay the salary of the drill worker involved in floating the Panamanian container ship Ever Given. Uh, they use the, the, the phrase Panamanian a lot here because the ship is Panamanian flagged. The facts, this is according to the Suez Canal Authority. Not true. We note that the drilling worker does not follow the Suez Canal Authority, but works for Nugaz, one of the external contractors from, from land excavators contracted by the authority during the Panamanian crisis. Uh, again, they're focusing on the flag of the vessel. And the company has earned all its entitlements from rental of equipment and employment benef benefits involved and in contact with the head of the company. The worker has been ensured that all his entitlements are obtained from work and additional satisfactory stimulus in recognition of the worker's effort. The Suez Canal Authority calls upon the citizens to investigate accuracy in what is being circulated about the authority. The Egyptian government doesn't like when you say bad things about the Egyptian government. Fortunately, I don't work for the Egyptian government and not to pay attention to rumors and anonymous news and the media appeals to obtain all information relevant to the authority from its official sources. In other words, if you want your news sources, come directly to the Suez Canal Authority. It is not clear that this guy has been paid or many people have been paid. Part of the $916 billion levy against the ship is to pay overtime for these workers. Matter of fact, the Egyptian government is being adamant about that. This is why we need this money for it. This is a Wall Street Journal uh, story on the same thing. Uh, Evergreen customers face new payments to get shippers uh, shipments ashore. So one of the things that I failed to mention the other day, but I should have, is this, is this ship has declared general average. I mentioned it in an earlier video. General average basically means that the cost to cover the salvage will be apportioned across the ship and the cargo. Depending on the value of the cargo on board, that cargo will have to pay a certain amount of money based on the percentage of its, of its worth. Uh, we saw that happen here, which means that it's not just the vessel under arrest, but the cargo too. And that's a big issue. Uh, this statement here is really interesting. Uh, the legal complications grew murky on Tuesday when Egypt said it had seized the Evergiven to force the ship's owner, again, she's leased to Ever, Evergreen, she's owned by the shipyard, which in turn sold her to this entity, Shosai Kisan Kasha Limited, to settle claims over damage to the canal and lost business adding up to roughly $1 billion. Uh, I talked about this in another story that the P&I insurance, because of the way it's structured, can cover up to about $3.1 billion in liability if it comes against them. However, if a lot of companies and ships and, and, and cargo holders start leveling fees against ever given, that's going to surpass $3.1 billion very quickly. I mean, Egypt alone is doing almost a billion dollars. Uh, before the ship can sail, cargo owners will have to pay a security deposit amounting around 10% of the estimated value of the cargo as a guarantee they'll abide by the insurance adjuster's resolution when the final bill comes. That's above and beyond the cost to ship the cargo right now. Again, you ship cargo by containers. You pay to rent the container to basically it's a contain container fee you're paying, but now you got to pay 10% of the value. If it's 10% of scrap metal, it's not that much. If it's 10% of a container full of iPads or computers, that's going to be expensive. Uh, we know, for example, there was a news source today that said uh, Lazy Boy, uh, the reclining chair company in the United States, has three containers worth of chairs on board. How much is that? I don't know what 10% of Lazy Boys are. Uh, Peloton bikes, uh, you know, if you're shipping a Peloton bike to uh, uh, Europe, uh, you have to pay 10% of that. If you're shipping microchips, small little microchips, but worth a lot of money, that can be into the millions. So this element right here is really escalating and the standoff between the Egyptians and Evergreen are, is growing. Uh, this is a story right here. Uh, Evergreen confirms uh, ever given arrest pending $916 million claim, including $300 million for the loss of reputation. So one of the things that uh, has been announced here is, is how this funds are, are, are being allocated, the $916 million claim. Evergreen stated in a release that the claim includes $300 million claim for a salvage bonus. In other words, Egypt wants $300 million for salvaging the vessel. Uh, that's what they want. Uh, they want $316 million for loss of services and revenues, basically. And then they want $300 million for, quote, loss of reputation. In other words, the Suez Canal has been hurt and they're fearing their reputation. And because of vessels diverting around 
and basically the poor perception that Egypt has and the Suez Canal has in the world attention, uh, that equates to $300 million for loss of reputation. I don't know if they get that. It'll be interesting to see if that's a loss of reputation. Uh, Anger is Suez Canal Authority arrests ever given submits $916 million claim. Again, what we're seeing here is, is a repeat of that. Here's that story again with 300 million for salvage, 300 million for loss of rep reputation. Uh, 1.9 million TUs of capacity from Suez Canal blockage set to swarm ports. So what's the impact of the six day closure of the Suez Canal? 1.9 million containers are about to hit ports that did not expect those containers to hit now. They were supposed to hit during the period uh, when Evergiven ran aground. Now they're going to hit all of a sudden. And what that means is it's going to cause backups, not just in Europe. This is going to cause backups, as you see here in Singapore, where 370,000 containers are en route to Singapore, uh, which were supposed to arrive sooner rather than later. And so this is happening both directions of the canal and it's gonna to continue to happen. Again, I read that story to you from Maersk that this is gonna continue on until late May. Uh, and again, just as a other update, this one is from Container News, talks about the same story here uh, about the fee here and the loss of reputation. So what's happening as a result of this? What's happening as a result of this? So one of the stories I found that was really interesting that, that as a result of this is a story from uh, Splash 247 on Hop Hog Lloyd. Hopog Lloyd is spending $550 million on new containers. Because of the delay in shipping containers, because they're not able to relocate empty containers because there's no time to move empty containers, uh, Hopog Lloyd has to spend money to build new containers. And that's a lot of money to be invested to build. Uh, they've already taken delivery, as they say here, of 150,000 containers this year. Now they're ordering 8,000 more containers on top of that. And this is just going to, number one, slow things up because wherever they're building these containers, they've got to be delivered to the ports. So if they're being delivered in China or Vietnam, uh, somewhere in Asia or overseas, somewhere else, they're going to have to be increased. And what you're doing is flooding the market with more containers. And you have to move those empties that happen. So all that relates to Ever Given in the Suez. But like if things aren't, going on enough, one of the requests I had is, hey, Sal, talk about what's happening in Los Angeles and Long Beach. And Los Angeles and Long Beach are, are suffering massive delays, as we're seeing uh, right now. We're seeing delays across the board. This image comes from uh, marine traffic of all the container ships off the port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, right now, the biggest port in the United States. And you can see the backlog there, vessels on berth. I talked about this the other day. I showed some of the vessels on berth. Here you see vessels sitting here, a whole batch of evergreen vessels, ever fame, ever loathsome, ever loyal, sitting there waiting to get in. So one of the problems we have in the Port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, is since COVID, since it's early 2020, uh, when things slow down and then all of a sudden demand spiked because people, e-commerce ordering online and because the port itself has slowed down because of covid and shutdowns it's getting very difficult to offload vessels so you have this massive backlog right here and the reason the ships don't ship to other places this is asked there's only a few ports on the west coast there's san francisco the oakland alameda terminal there's seattle washington the problem is they don't have as good rail and road structure coming out of them so you can offload there you can they're at capacity now you can offload there, but you have a similar problem with getting the cargo out of the berths and, and off the, the terminal. Well, as if things were not bad enough, you have this, uh, truck drivers strike at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Uh, without truck drivers, without people to get the containers off the berth, this is going to turn into a bigger nightmare right there. And you've seen a, uh, a, a strike uh, being done. Uh, this is coming out of the Teamsters. Illegally fired truck drivers denied back pay, refused to re recognize and bargain with the union uh, that the drivers uh, legally won. And, and so basically, this is an issue. Uh, the union, whatever your view of unions are, unions have a big role in maritime commerce for a long time. And West Coast has been ripe for union strikes throughout the history. Uh, the argument basically here is you can make a good money driving a truck. But at the same time, too, is if you don't get that good contract, 
one of the things that happens is they will hire new truck drivers to do this and pay very low wages to do that. And one of the things that's happening here is now this is going to magnify the, ba uh, the backlog. And I have to tell you, the time to strike in labor is when you're in most demand. You don't strike when they don't need you. You strike when they need you at the most inopportune time. And that's what we're seeing right now with truck drivers. And this goes to a larger issue of infrastructure within the United States, not just transportation by sea, not just coastal transportation with Jones Act vessels, but this deals with road, rail, uh, highways, chassis, drivers, you name it. All this plays out here. And we're seeing that play out here right now. Again, this is not new to the United States. Up in the port of Montreal, uh, we're seeing a, uh, a strike that's going to spark fears of more congestion on the east coast of Canada. So we're, we're just seeing this magnify right now. We're seeing this magnify. And again, what you're seeing is a butterfly effect. Again, ever given going sideways in the canal uh, is just one element of a larger issue that's going on. Other stories too, real quick. Uh, this is what I'm talking about uh, with the intermodal outside the ports. New U.S. intermodal rail yards clog up as port congestion and delays conclude. Uh, we at one time had the most advanced railway system in the world. I'm not talking about bullet trains delivering passengers. I'm talking about freight. That's what we use our railway for largely is freight. But congestion and lack of trucks and drivers and chassis and simple basic things are really causing headaches to uh, occur. Again, coastal trade sounds great. You know, let's have coastal trade up and down the West Coast. The problem is most of that cargo that goes in the West Coast goes in the interior. And it is much easier because of port congestion, port costs. If I got to move something from Los Angeles to Seattle, it's much easier to throw in the back of a chassis of a truck and drive it 27 hours, then have to go through two ports, pay those additional handling costs, and still have to pay for truck drivers anyway to drop it off and take it out of the terminal. I'd much rather pay for one person to do it. But railway is causing this massive congestion right here. So I was going to give you a great talk today on containerization, the history of containerization, talk about Malcolm McLean, talk about some great books. I will do that, don't worry, I will, I will come back to this. But there was just too much in the news today not to talk about this. Uh, I will also mention I did a podcast with uh, the Center of International Maritime Security, uh, SIMSEC. Uh, it is a uh, little bit longer of a podcast. It's uh, about 40 minutes uh, of me talking about really recapping the events regarding Ever Given. So if you're interested in that, I will have this here. I'll have the links to all these in the show notes. Please feel free to take a look at them. Again, I ask if you're interested, you enjoy what I'm saying, subscribe. Subscribe to my channel. Give, it, give this a thumbs up. Uh, share with your friends. Uh, if you don't like what I say, don't listen. Plenty of choices out there. The YouTube world is full of people like me talking. Uh, I know what I know. I, I, I don't know more than that. I, you know, I, I don't claim to be an expert at all. I am sure not an insurance expert. What I'm trying to do is give you an overview of an event that many of you not, may not know a lot about, and that's in the maritime world, the world I do know a little, little something about. Uh, so I'm fine with criticism. I always am. I've, I've, I've been a teacher for a long time. I'm used to criticism. I've been married a long time, so I'm really used to criticism. So again, you know, that's fine. But again, if you're, if, if you don't like what I'm saying, you don't enjoy what I'm, I'm saying, don't listen, you know, and, and there's plenty of places for you to go. If you do listen, I appreciate the feedback, love positive feedback. I love hearing that people are enjoying the channel and getting something out of it. Uh, and so please, uh, if you're interested, please tune in. I will try to put this video together, but who knows what's going to happen. Uh, I've been asked to do a TV show later this afternoon talking about this event because this event does not seem to want to go away. So again, I'm Sal McCaglano. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you soon.